Jason. Jason, um, before I get started, is my presentation looking OK on the screen? Yeah, I can see it. OK, okay. good deal. Um, so you might notice that um, I work for Fish, Wildlife and Parks, but my presentation is formatted as a GNRC presentation. And that's really because um, this this talk is really going to revolve around my experience working for DNRC um, on timber sales and how to bring wildlife needs into the timber sale process. And I was really lucky to work there with a lot of great foresters and I learned a lot about silviculture. So hopefully I'll be able to share some things that you can um, bring into um, your jobs as well. So the first thing that um, we probably better do before we dive in is to define the fine filter. And the fine filter is really where we can address the uniqueness of each individual parcel of land, and particularly any unusual or sensitive wildlife species. And it's really complementary to the course filter approach that um, Tori and Andrew just finished describing. The course filter ensures that we're keeping all the parts and pieces of a healthy forest, including snags, course rooted debris, corridors, and an appropriate mix of age classes and forest types. And if we do this well, most of our Montana wildlife species should have good habitat since they evolved with these disturbances. But the course filter alone doesn't necessarily maintain all species on the landscape. Rare or specialized species may not necessarily be protected by general habitat management, and they really need our special care and attention. And this is where the fine filter comes into play. It focuses on the needs of single species to ensure that biodiversity is maintained. And the emphasis is on species that are particularly sensitive to forest management activities. So this is important because once again, we want to maintain biodiversity on the landscape, um, but it really can also help us prevent federal listings that can impact our ability to manage forests. So um, the blackback woodpecker, which Andrew had mentioned earlier, um, is one example of a fine filter species that can really benefit from some additional attention um, just because their habitat use is so specialized. So you can see our blackback woodpecker in the photo in the upper right side there. They're unique because um, they have this all black back that helps them blend into their um, environment. Their burn specialists, they use stands heavily for a three to five year period post burn when they key, key in on really um, high severity um, fires. And so the photos here are of a burn salvage in DNRC's Plains unit that shows some high quality blackback woodpecker habitat. And this was actually one of those burns where in this 640 acre section, there really wasn't anything green left that I remember at all. And it's interesting, I've, I've also heard from loggers that sometimes blackback woodpeckers will show up in log yards with burned trees and how they detect these burned trees is kind of unknown. It may has something to do with beetle pheromones, but um, they really prefer large diameter trees for nesting, but it also helps them out to retain small diameter trees where they can forage. So Andrew had shown this picture, this um, burn salvage where not really much was retained um, post harvest, and it can really help um, blackback woodpeckers and other animals out as well, just to keep keep some of the submerge or things that aren't particularly valuable to salvage anyway, they can provide good foraging substrate for blackwood, blackback woodpeckers and other species. Um, so since they have such a unique habitat requirement, they're a species that at DNRC, we would consider some special mitigations for, which might include timing restrictions to help them pull off breeding or possibly um, just leaving some areas unsalvaged so that they have a, a good place to, to breed and forage. Okay, so um, for this talk, I, I really wanted to cover some, we have some, a couple of learning objectives here. And the first one was to define the fine filter. So we got that accomplished. Um, 
And then I also wanted to go through how um, how to decide which species to consider in the fine filter. Also, when you should consider special mitigations, how to address special needs um, of our fine filter species through prescriptions, timing restrictions, and things like that. And then also to keep it from um, being too theoretical, I plan to use a timber sale that I worked on in the Stillwater State Forest to kind of just illustrate how this works in practice. Um, and then Jason also asked me to uh, just kind of go through some special considerations for deer and elk habitat. And here on the left, we've got a photo of elk that are foraging on lichens on their winter range um, near one of our DNRC timber sales in Kalispell. And also just want to um, put out there that these are all suggestions based on my experience at DNRC and there's really no right or wrong way to do this and I hope it's helpful. So our timber seal example that I'll be referring to as we move along is called the striker bull timber seal and it's located north of only in the Stillwater State Forest. The area is surrounded by state lands, some forest service lands, and also some scattered private sections. And overall, the area is managed um, for timber. And DNRC had proposed harvest of two and a half million board feet from um, 667 acres in this timber sale. And the stands consisted of Douglas fir, western larch, lodgepole, and some western red cedar. And the project lead was Jeremy Aiken in the Stillwater Forest, and it's in the process of being logged now. I think it's just about complete. And I chose this sale as our example because it had a lot of just unusual fine filter species pop up that I had never handled or had to think about before. And I think it helps illustrate logistics and thought processes that you can go through when facing um, new uh, or unique wildlife situations that you need to bring into your timber sale design process. So as a the wildlife biologist on this sale, the first thing um, that I had to figure out was what kind of fine filter species I was going to be thinking about or potentially mitigating for on this timber sale. And I know just from the location and from having done work on other timber sales before that we're going to have to consider our threatened species, grizzly bears and Canada lynx, but wasn't totally sure what else might come up. There's a lot of sensitive species out there and um, it can be hard to determine which ones to pay attention to. And in Montana, there's actually 217 animals that are considered species of concern. So obviously there's no way we can bring the um, special habitat requirements of all those animals into our timber sale. So that brings us to our first question. Which species, species should you consider in your fine filter? And it's, I'd say, really specific to land ownership. Um, agencies like the Forest Service and DNRC typically maintain a list of species that they'll regularly consider. And private landowners may also have some obligations under management plans associated with conservation easements or possibly with um, habitat conservation plans with Fish and Wildlife Service. But I'd say in general, species to consider typically include any species that are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so in our area in Northwest Montana, that was usually grizzly bears and lynx. Um, and then also species listed as a species of concern by the state and that are considered sensitive forest management. Um, and more information on those species of concern can be found in the state, state wildlife action plan, which Tori will be talking more about after lunch. Um, and for reference, I put together a list of species that DNRC and the Forest Service Region 1 regularly considers on their timber sales as a starting point in case it's helpful for you. And that's 
um, something that Jason will be sharing through OneDrive. And I also just want to mention that just because a species isn't on one of these lists doesn't mean that, um, you know, at least at DNRC, we wouldn't mitigate for it. For example, goshawks were not on our list of species, but they were something that popped up pretty regularly. So we would we would do something to protect them on timber sales where they came up. And then um, most of the time we're often going to manage um, or mitigate for animals managed as big game by Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And particularly um, for me, it seemed like winter range was something that came up pretty frequently. And then for public agencies, um, issues identified through the public scoping process sometimes will also influence what kind of species you're gonna consider in your fine filter and potentially um, develop some special mitigations for. So another important question to consider is when to develop mitigations. So for example, if we're thinking about Canada lynx, do you mitigate for them only if there's potential, if there's potential habitat there or only if there's a, been a recent sighting of a lynx? And so I think this one is probably specific to um, who you work for as well, but uh, at DNRC, here's how we looked at it. If a species had habitat present, um, that was federally listed like Canada lynx and grizzly bear, plus the subset of species of concern like fishers or pileated woodpeckers, then we included mitigations into our timber sale design. Um, agencies typically have habitat models that they can rely on, but if you don't, the heritage program can be a really great uh, reference to uh, kind of figure out what species might have some habitat in your timber sale area. And Bryce is going to be talking about that more this afternoon. Um, and then we also mitigated for species with documented occurrences. So like, you know, a sighting that's been recorded. And typically for us, those were nest locations or other sensitive sites like a wolf den or um, something of that nature. So getting back to our timber sale example, striker bull, the first question is um, to think about what species I need to consider. So I like to do my office work first so I could be efficient with my time in the field. And one of the first things I always do is I run the heritage program um, environmental report, which kind of gives you an idea of what kind of potential species habitat might be there and also some more information on those documented occurrences like nests and things of that nature. So I ran that report and I got back 22 species of concern or potential species of concern. And from that, I narrowed it down to sensitive sites. And so I found that there was a loon nest um, close to our timber sale harvest units, which is an important one because there's only 72 pairs of loons in Montana, give or take, and they're pretty sensitive to disturbance. We also had a trumpeter swan nest come up, which is another pretty rare occurrence. There's only about 300 to 700 or so of these birds in the Rocky Mountain breeding population. So we would definitely wanna give them um, close attention. And then the big surprise for me was a pika colony. Um, I highly recommend running the heritage program reports for, for this reason, because you just never know some of the things that are going to come up. Um, I never heard of anyone having to address a pika colony on a timber sale. So they're typically found at high elevation scree fields where they gather up plants like this guy here is doing, and they cure the plants to store for winter. And um, this just happened to be one of the really low elevation pika colony sites. And um, so I knew that was something we were going to have to follow up on. So we got our um, a few things out of the heritage program report, the trumpeter swan nest, the loon nest and the pika colony through scoping. I, I also learned about an osprey nest 
and then also um, mule deer winter range, uh, which I knew was going to be an important issue and one that was going to take a fair amount of effort probably to mitigate. And then just through our internal data review, um, I knew we were going to have to look at grizzly bears, lynx, pileated woodpeckers, and also fishers. So the next step for me typically is to kind of get prepped to go out into the woods and I start thinking about how, how I might address some of these wildlife needs in the timber sale process. So the first one, like um, Tori had mentioned a little bit about, is timing restrictions can be really important to protect sensitive sites or animals during critical periods, like um, winter range, for example, with our mule deer that had uh, popped up in our timber sale review. Um, for raptors, incubation all the way through birds being capable of strong flight is, is really important to consider. We can also protect some of our fine filter species through specialized um, prescriptions. Um, one that I've used before is a, a special one to retain old growth characteristics, or sometimes we would develop specialized mitigations for winter range. So I was thinking quite a lot about the mule deer winter range that had come up and if we were going to need to design a specialized prescription to allow them to persist on the landscape. Um, another thing that you can consider for um, fine filter species is using special operating requirements or SORs. And these are things you can put into your timber sale contract specifying um, that certain habitat elements are retained. And this is particularly important for things that can't be marked with paint. Um, so often we use them for retention of regen to provide some of that habitat heterogeneity. Um, it can also be great for timing restrictions or for retaining snags and coarse rooted debris. So kind of things that you, you can't really mark very well, I think is when SORs come into play. And then once again, I, I kind of assembled some examples of things that have worked well for us at DNRC over the years as far as specialized prescriptions and SORs that might come in handy. Um, so it's difficult to design some good ones, I think, and takes a lot of skill. And then the other thing I'm always thinking about too is how do these mitigations go from idea to a reality? And it takes a lot of problem solving to translate wildlife research and science into results on the ground. And I definitely had to learn this one the hard way a few times. So I think if I have one takeaway, it's probably that any wildlife mitigations need to be captured in paint, they need to be flagged, or they need to be put in the timber sale contract. And it's just, it's so important to think about if I'm, if you're not around to administer the sale, is someone else going to know or be able to interpret all those wildlife mitigations and make sure they actually happened on the ground? Um, so after this whole process, I, we had our list of species to consider on the striker bull timber sale and had some ideas of mitigations to kind of help out our fine filter species. And now it's time to go into the field. So it's always important to follow up on those documented occurrences. So um, the main thing we want to know is, are they still valid? So there is this uh, a couple of nest sites that came up in the heritage program report, and sometimes those are out of date or they're not used by animals anymore. So it's it's important to go check those out in the field. And also it's, it's great if you can be out in your timber sale area in June or July for nesting raptors. So there's plenty of nesting raptors out there that are never going to come up on a heritage program report. And it's great if you're a, a forester, if you can take a GPS point and take note too of what direction the bird is coming in from that can be really helpful for biologists that have to go out and find those nest features afterwards. And maybe an idea if if you know what the species is that can be helpful. Um, we've had foresters call us up and put birds on speakerphone, 
which is really funny, but also actually very helpful. So you can get an ID from that sometimes. And you'll know um, you might have a nesting raptor if the bird's vocalizing and following you around. Or in the case of the meanest bird in the woods, the goshawk, you'll know it's an issue if they pin you down to the ground and run you out of the stand. So um, just pass that along to your, your um, biologist promptly if you can. Um, another thing to do that I would do when I was out there was assess potential habitat. And I was always particularly interested in canopy cover of mature trees, but then also what what habitat there is in the understory. So that's really critical habitat component for a lot of species. And also just follow up to see if the stands are providing habitat for our threatened and endangered species in particular, and if habitat models are accurate. So following up on our, our fine filter species, the common loons, I, I found their nest was active and they were nesting near the harvest units. So we protected them through a timing restriction that we um, captured in the operating periods for the contract, for the um, harvest units in the contract. And we used the timing restriction of April 15th through July 31st within 500 feet of the lakeshore, but it really ended up being much wider than that because we just applied the timing restriction to the entire harvest unit. Um, I think this mitigation was pretty successful. Loons are great swimmers, but awkward on land, and they can actually kick their nest, the egg right off the nest and into the water, which isn't great. Um, for our other sensitive sites, the osprey didn't have any use within the last five years, and so we didn't end up including any mitigations for that. The trumpeter swan nest and the pika colony um, ended up having the harvest units that were near them dropped due to some forestry reasons, wasn't due to the, the sensitive sites. But if I was to mitigate for that, I probably would do some research in the literature and consult with someone like Tori to make sure we had a good plan moving forward. So um, next, let's see here. Um, okay, so it's also helpful to use SORs for things like lynx habitat that are hard to retain with paint or flagging. Um, lynx are deep snow specialists with huge feet and are found in limited areas of Montana. Starvation is a really important cause of lynx mortality they can eat one snowshoe hare per day and areas that can support a high density of snowshoe hares is really important. And um, it can break, be important to break up big open areas without anything in the understory. So we like to protect it, um, protect this kind of habitat feature with a special operating requirement. And the one that we would use was to retain isolated islands of advanced regeneration, one tenth of an acre. Um, and how that remains scattered for wildlife hiding cover throughout the harvest unit. So good contract admins obviously going to be pretty important for that one. And here's a picture of what that looks like in practice. Um, I was really happy with this. There's a lot of um, small trees in the understory here. We've got branches touching the ground. So it's a great place to allow snowshoe hares to hide and move through some of the um, more open areas. And just, I'd also mention too, it benefits other species that maybe are foraging in those more open areas, but it helps them, I think, feel secure enough to move through the stand. Um, so the next issue that we had to address was our mule deer winter range. And this timber sale overlapped um, winter range that was identified by a recent radio collaring effort. Uh, but unfortunately, winter habitat and the importance of thermal cover wasn't really evaluated by the researchers at the time. The research really focused on summer range. So we knew um, this area was going to be pretty important because the data showed the deer were only using a one to two square mile area. So we wanted to make sure we got a close look at this important um, habitat use. And I think in these kinds of situations where there's not very good guidance out there in the literature, it's 
especially important to get in touch with an expert and look at the stand together with the forester, um, agency biologist, and also uh, a wildlife biologist from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And it's good to see the same thing and have an honest conversation about how to move forward. So before we were heading out there, some of the options that I was considering was, you know, are we going to have to retain a certain percentage of canopy cover so that it provides a good snow intercept from them? Or is this going to be a situation where you have to cut, cut certain areas and then retain and completely leave other portions of their winter range alone. And it's hard to know until you get everyone out there to evaluate the stand. I thought this area might be really unique with big healthy trees and um, with good crowns providing snow intercept, but that actually wasn't the case when we got out there. It turned out that the trees had really thin crowns and overall were a small diameter in an area with a lot of rocky out outcrops. So I think we were all pretty surprised about that. And we brought in Ethan Lula from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to look this over with us and make a plan. And we we decided on um, only doing a timing restriction from January 15th through April 1st, just based on that radio caller data. Um, that was when they were using the area most heavily. And we also put out a, a game camera out there and I got a couple pictures. And that also supported that, that um, time frame. The deer, male deer really didn't come into the stand until January. Before that, it was mostly white-tailed deer, which was interesting. And then they stayed there through April or so. Um, and just based on the stand condition, vegetation retention didn't make sense to us or to Ethan with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And the way that we had already proposed it, um, there were going to be some areas that'd be cut, but then some areas that the mule deer were using would would not be impacted. So, so luckily that all worked out without having to drop or um, cut, drop any areas that were proposed for cutting. So here's a couple photos of that timber sale in action, and I think we all did a pretty good job of working together to get a good finished product. The initial list of fine filter species was kind of daunting and can be intimidating initially, but I think it all comes together in the end. And we used a combination of timing restrictions and SORs to accomplish this. And I hear that the mule deer are still using the area, although they probably won't use the cutting units in um, time periods with heavy snowpack. And logging is almost complete and DNRC has hauled out. 657 loads of saw logs and 271 loads of pulp and post and ram. So next we'll kind of just switch gears here and get into the special topic that Jason asked that I cover, which is how do you address specific issues specific to big game and white-tailed deer thermal cover? So critical winter range is often at a low elevation and it may be limited in availability due to um, residential development. Thick cover provides snow intercept, reduces wind speed and provides thermal benefits, which is really important in heavy snowpack years. Animals travel long distances to reach these critical areas and winter range is important because Local impacts to winter range can impact these populations across a much broader landscape. And without winter range, deer populations are susceptible to dramatic population declines and fluctuations in response to winter severity. So they're really keen in on Douglas fir, Oregon grape, and arboreal lichens um, in our area in Northwest Montana. And I think one of the things that makes managing winter range so challenging is that there's not one definition of thermal cover out there. It's typically somewhere around 70% cover of trees that are nine inches in diameter or greater and at least 45 feet tall. But I've also seen definitions that require a lower retention with 25% canopy cover of trees 10 inches or greater. So I think 
in when dealing with winter range, it's best to bring uh, a biologist from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in to to discuss it if you have the time or the capability. It um, it's good to consider treatments that retain desi like the di desired level of canopy cover or possibly a group select treatment that allow animals to move through different cover patches. And some of the um, prescriptions that we've used in the past will be shared in the supplementary materials in case they're helpful. I think it's good too just to discuss with biologists, you know, what if they could have their ideal situation, what what would their thermal cover look like for deer? And you may not be able to get there on stand conditions, but it's at least great to have have that translated into the the forestry um, language with uh, diameter and canopy cover if possible. Um, so here I just included a graph to show how important uh, winter severity is to um, deer population. So we've got the fawn doe ratio here on the left hand side and then the bottom is an index of winter severity and just note how clear that relationship is. So the more severe the winter, the, you can see that um, fawn to doe ratio really decreases dramatically and it I think just illustrates that good winter range habitat helps animals to expend less energy during cold temperatures and times with um, heavy snowpack. So it's just really important. It also can be just very challenging to operate in winter range. Here we've got a photo of deer following the clipper around on a timber sale in the swan unit. I was really shocked the first time that I saw this happen. Um, it, the deer sometimes will flock into areas that are being harvested because they want to access those lichens and it, it can just be quite challenging. Um, it's also a challenge after the harvesting is complete sometimes to get new trees growing because deer love to eat seedlings in the winter with ponderosa pine being a real favorite. They also really like to browse on Douglas fir as well. One challenging area that we have in Northwest Montana is the Cliff Lakes, Lakes area near Kalispell, where there's a high density of animals at 500 deer per square mile that sometimes pack into this one area. And we have this issue where bark beetles are killing the overstory, so they're not going to be, the area is not going to provide good thermal cover, but we also are having a hard time getting trees to grow because the deer browse um, the seedlings that we plant. So we designed an experiment out there to look at the effectiveness of chemical treatments, um, blood meal and nets. And so far it's looking like Vexar nets are gonna probably be the best solution to get trees growing out there. So just very challenging. And then finally, um, I just want to talk a little bit about elk security. This is something I'm not quite as familiar with. So I reached out to Vanna Bakadori, FWP's Butte area biologist, for some more information there. And she um, she shared that elk security habitat provides a place for elk to hide and rest during the hunting season, um, hopefully in areas with public hunting access. It's a really important management objective and it has three components, the vegetative curtain, the distance distance from roads, and timing, as in timing restrictions. So logging can impact all three through vegetation removal, road construction, and displacement due to active logging. And I think all three components can really come into play when deciding how to um, manage an elk habitat. So in areas with Limited public access, it might make sense to log with more regeneration treatments. However, if there's a lot of open roads and the vegetative, then the vegetative curtain really becomes more important. And it might be good to consider things with a heavier um, retention, like a group selection treatment. And I thought it was interesting that research on collared animals showed that elk selected an order of preference for areas, first of all, with no public hunting access, so they're smart, 
areas further from roads, and then areas with high canopy cover. So when considering hunter opportunity, we really like to consider all of these aspects. And I think it's interesting that roads really were playing a, a bigger role than canopy cover in habitat selection. And similar to winter range, there's not really one definition of elk security, which makes it a challenge to manage for. So one definition um, from Ranglac et al. in 2017 was that security cover consists of 9% canopy cover greater than a mile from an open road, but it has to be 5,000 acres or greater. Um, and that's from central and southwest Montana. And then there's also the Hillis definition, which defines security cover as greater than 250 acres, but only half a mile from an open road with canopy cover of 30%. So once again, I think it's great if you have the time and the opportunity to work with your local fish and fish, wildlife and parks biologists whenever possible. Um, FWP really sees land managers as an important partner and is very interested in collaborating to address the needs of elk and deer on the landscape. And in region one, we've had a lot of discussions about how logging can actually be very beneficial um, for our elk and deer populations by creating good foraging opportunities. And um, there's a real desire to collaborate and work together to make this happen. And then finally, just one more issue to talk about, which is um, conifer encroachment and how important logging can be as a habitat restoration tool and aspen stands. So Vanna shared this information with me from the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area near Anaconda, um, where they had designed a treatment to restore aspen stands. And the treatment involved removing conifers within 100 feet of the aspen stand because this disturbing, disturbance causes the aspen to um, sucker and it helps get, it, get those like new stands growing. And they treated about 2,200 acres. So we've got a photo here of um, the site pretreatment. And then we can see here again, the same site with active logging. So lots of conifer removal going on here. And then also the same site, 10 years post-treatment. So um, lots of nice aspen suckers and I think turned out really well, they were, they were quite happy with it. So logging can be a great tool to help animals out as well. So we, we covered all of our topics here. Um, the fine filter is where we're addressing the needs of uh, individual species so that we can retain biodiversity, provided some resources to help you figure out what which species you might wanna consider in your fine filter. Um, when you should consider a species, if they have an occurrence there or if they have potential habitat. And then also give you some ideas of how to um, mitigate for, um, let's see here, how to protect fine filter species with timing restrictions, specialized prescriptions, or SORs. And then just as a parting thought, um, working forests are great wildlife habitat, but we can always find ways to improve and work together. And thanks for listening and to all the foresters and wildlife biologists that helped me to compile this information. And special thanks to the Stillwater State Forest that let a wildlife biologist talk about their timber sale and describe it. So that's pretty brave. <laughs> and with that, if there's any time, I can take questions. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Um, there's a couple questions, and since I gave, since I set everybody behind basically by five minutes when I asked my question to Andrew, we'll uh, we'll do the same for you. So we'll we'll give you um, five minutes. There's a question I had um, was, you know, I've seen, and I'm sure a lot of other foresters have seen, you know, and you and you even mentioned it, tons of white-tailed deer inactive timber har harvest operations also had the same experience with a lot of elk on winter range because they're attracted to those needles and, and Briaria species that are all of a sudden 
from coming from the canopy down to the forest floor. Uh, but is that not the same with mule deer or um, and is that why Ethan uh, suggested the timing restriction? Um, I, I don't think we really know that much about mule deer ra winter range in northwest Montana, but sometimes for so I guess I don't really know if they were coming in to forage on the needles. I didn't hear any reports of them doing that so much. I think they were still around, but not following the clipper around like you'll sometimes see white tailed deer do. And then we did include that that timing restriction for, for mule deer because they were just really localized in that one to two square mile area. So it seemed like a pretty high priority not to disturb them and play, displace them to other areas. But we also at DNRC would include timing restrictions for white-tailed deer winter range as well, especially if Fish, Wildlife, and Parks had um, commented on it. But um, sometimes you get surprised and deer will just be attracted to those timber sale harvest units in, in areas that you weren't expecting. Like in that photo I shared from the Swan, I, I didn't really know that they were going to do that. I thought that they were um, primarily keying in on areas further south of those harvest units. So hopefully that answers that. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, sounds like a good opportunity, like you said, to work with the area biologists um, because, yeah, we don't know that a lot of times as foresters, how they're using those areas. So um, Dale, Critical V mentioned wolves too. Do you, do you have any experience with wolves sensitivity to active timber har harvest operations? Um, I haven't actually had to mitigate for a wolf den, but we, if, if there's an issue, usually Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, be, like working for the state, would comment on our timber sales, and they would ask us, I think, to um, include a timing restriction, but sometimes it's actually, I think, worse if word gets out where a den is, it's, it's almost better just to, um, leave that alone is what I've heard from wolf specialists. And then they usually were not in their logging because of spring breakup and during the critical periods for wolf dens. But it's another thing that's good just to check in with, with fish, wildlife and parks to get some guidance. But we have had situations where wolves have come in and been killing deer on landings. So that was an interesting one, but um, usually we just, yeah, try and be tolerant of them and let them do their thing. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I guess if that's where the deer are, then the wolves are going to be there too. So, and, and the other predators. Um, and then Chris Forstall asked a question uh, that I guess was to me about uh, aspen and soil disturbance. Um, and yeah, definitely, you know, and, and I think I pro I'm going to provide some aspen stuff that, that we've used uh in fwp projects in the shared folder but yeah um when you disturb the ground that definitely stimulates suckering of aspen so you can kind of accomplish a couple of different objectives with harvesting those conifers in there you know and that might be a good reason to do it maybe more in the summer or fall season when you can actually get that or if you can't for some other reason you've got to do it in the winter and you're not going to get that ground disturbance because there's too much snow or frozen ground come back in with prescribed fire maybe you know knock down the submerged create a fuel bed and then and then follow it up with prescribed fire but we've seen pretty good success too with just by opening up and getting the sunlight down to the forest floor that we get suckering even without a lot of disturbance so it really kind of depends but something that you kind of you know work through a little bit um and and figure out what works you know like one approach is really been like perfect maybe but um and browse is another thing to factor into if you got a lot of elk on the winter range like they're just going to mow down your seedlings so maybe you want to drop some trees kind of pin in the the aspen region so that doesn't all get mowed down by by uh elk or cattle um so yeah with that it's 12 20 um lunch break is coming up here uh i'm gonna go ahead and stop recording